Join me as I explore one of the most spectacular archaeological sites on Earth, Petra. Located in southwestern Jordan, this glorious red rose city was literally carved into the Shara Mountains. Made famous by Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade, Petra was once the Wall Street of ancient Arabia. Over 2,000 years ago, its streets flowed with treasures of gold and silver. Just how did this majestic city become the center of wealth and power in the Arabian desert? To find out, right there, I use ground-penetrating radar to probe the site, examine Petra's only surviving manuscript, and gain rare access to go underneath Petra's most famous monument. We're digging for the truth. God, you can feel that in your shoulder. And we're going to extremes to do it. That's kind of spooky. Several thousand years ago, the deserts of the Middle East served as an ancient highway, the crossroads for traders connecting Asia, Europe, and North Africa. Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein. I've returned to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan to explore a city that was the center point of wealth and commerce in this region, the ancient stone city of Petra. From Jordan's capital, Amman, it's a 120-mile journey south down to Petra. There's no greater way to see the desert landscape than to go by camel, but that could take several days. For this trek, I've got a better idea. Built over 2,000 years ago, the ancient city of Petra lies hidden within 20 square miles of Jordan's Shara Mountains. Camel caravans brought precious trade goods from the Far East, Africa, and Europe into the mountain city. By modern estimates, scholars believe millions in gold and silver were exchanged at Petra, making the city's rulers incredibly wealthy and powerful. By the second century BC, Petra was ruled by a monarchy known as the Nabataeans. To gain a unique perspective on these ancient monarchs, I'm meeting a member of Jordan's Hashemite royal family. His Royal Highness Prince Mirad Rad Al Hussein meets me at the city gates to guide me into Petra. So Joshua, this is the beginning of the Sikh. This is the gorge that will lead us into the center of Petra. Etched by centuries of wind and water erosion, the nearly mile-long Sikh creates a natural fault in the Shara Mountains. The canyon walls reach up to over 25 stories in height. What does Petra mean? Uh, Petra means uh, rock in, uh, in Greek. In Greek? Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. It means rock in gotcha. Greek. Gotcha. And, and this is the famous canyon from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Yeah, sure. This is, a, this is where they rode in on, on horseback. You know? The majestic Sikh was the canyon where Harrison Ford and Sean Connery made their dramatic entrance into Petra. And every day be sustainable. In 1995, the Prince's family and the Petra National Trust spearheaded an intensive project to restore it to its original condition. Over a thousand years of sand and silt debris were removed, exposing the Sikh's beautifully detailed stonework. The center. Josh, you, you got to take a look at this. This is really uh, amazing. Do you notice anything on the rock face here? I see feet. Yeah, and there's a little bit more if you look carefully. Other feet. Okay, so here yeah. we have a, a man. Uh huh. Well, these look like camel feet. Yeah, the legs, unfortunately, are, are missing. Yeah. Prince Mirad tells me this eroded carving once fully illustrated a camel caravan. He believes the scene was etched here as a fitting tribute to the traders who made the Nabataean royals very rich. Way too petty. Yes, yes. And, and those, uh, it's just representative of the trade, and the trade was so important to the, uh, to the Nabataeans. Mm -hmm. uh, trade was their uh, lifeline. So we're actually getting close to the city itself? Yeah, very close. It's just a little way down. We keep going? Yeah, let's go. The best is yet to come. As we near the end of the Sikh, the, the prince explains the Nabataeans created a majestic scene in the rock, designed to humble and impress all foreign traders who entered. Check this out, Josh. It's really the most beautiful thing in, uh, in Petra. It's, uh, Absolutely spectacular. Though. Carved in the face of the Shara Mountains is Petra's most famous and impressive monument, Al Khazneh, better known as the Treasury. 
Towering over 13 stories in height, the facade is awe-inspiring. But what was it? And could ancient treasures still be found here today? Prince Mirrod and I will meet again later. But for now, I'm heading into the Treasury Plaza. Have a wonderful journey in, in Petra. Thank you. Okay. Take it from here. Take it easy. I'm meeting Dr. Khairia Amar from the Jordan Museum. Hello, I've been waiting for you. Thank you for waiting for me. Khairia and I start by hiking up a mountain ledge overlooking the treasury. Great view. Where she points out a feature on the top of the carved facade. If you look at the top, at the urn at the top. Got it, yep. Over right there, there. Okay. yeah. And you can see there are poke marks all over. These mm -hmm. are really bullet holes. There was a local belief mm -hmm. that that urn contained a treasure in gold. And they called the building the treasury. And they called the building the treasury. Oh, okay. And given the prominence of this location, this would seem to be like perhaps the best place to keep a treasure. Exactly. Kyria explains that according to one legend, the urn hid the treasure of an Egyptian pharaoh. Another says that pirates from the Red Sea moved their booty to Petra and hid it in the urn. Okay. So people would fire weapons at the urn hoping to break it like, like a pinata, and then the treasure would fall out. Exactly, yes. And has any treasure ever fallen out? No, it's just solid rock. We sure? Yes. Has any treasure ever been found there? Well, this building is a treasure. Okay, archaeologically <laughs> speaking. Yeah. Shall we? In order to put the theories of hidden treasure to rest, Kharia and I head down to the treasury. We've been granted special access to go past the doorway and enter the main hall. The two chambers. Yeah. Unlike the ornate facade, the interior of the treasury building is Spartan. One large, perfectly proportioned room flanked by three small antechambers. But creating this building was an incredible achievement considering it wasn't built, but carved into a sheer rock face. Khairia explains the entire structure was sculpted from the top down. So when they got to the ceiling level, they would make this opening come in to do the ceiling. You, you start at the roof? Yes. The ceiling, I guess, yeah, and then come down. And then come down. So they pulled everything the, from the top out that first little door. Yes. Until they got to the real door. And then when they got to the, where the doorway is, they would have another exit point. And these Experts little... believe nearly 60,000 cubic feet of rock was removed to create the interior chambers. Tough work for the artisans who carved this incredible monument using simple hammers and chisels. Today, the treasury is empty, with no markings or inscriptions to indicate its function. Kharia tells me that scholars have long puzzled over the true purpose of the treasury. And this mystery goes beyond this ornate structure. Most of Petra's famed architecture resembles the treasury building. Beautifully decorated facades with simple, vacant interiors. Just what were these empty chambers used for? Petra is uninhabited today. But at its height, archaeologists believe up to 30,000 Nabataeans lived in this protected canyon, with homes built inside a series of interlocking ravines. And up to 500,000 foreign travelers pitched tent outside Petra's mountain walls. Just how did the Nabataeans lure the camel caravans to Petra to trade their goods here in the Arabian desert? I've returned to the Middle East to explore Jordan's most spectacular archaeological site, Petra. Having entered Petra's Seek and seen the famous treasury, I'm astonished by the sheer size, natural beauty, and complexity of this immense Nabataean city. Archaeologists estimate that up to 30,000 Nabataean citizens lived within the protective canyons of the Shara Mountains, while as many as 500,000 desert traders took shelter outside Petra's walls. Just how could a population that large be sustained here in the Arabian desert? The landscape here at Petra is classified as arid desert. Rainfall here averages about six inches per year. If this region held as many as half a million people, providing enough drinking water would have been a major priority. 
Local Petra archaeologist Dr. Saad Twaisi takes me along a mountain ridge to show me how the Nabataeans were able to collect rainwater by carving a series of connecting channels into Petra's sandstone walls. Water will come down here. These channels would act like stone gutters, draining the water along the face of the mountain through canyons, feeding into ground level reservoirs called cisterns. Uh -huh. So they would carve, this is where the rock was? Yeah, it was solid. They carved it like this in order to allow water to go there. To create these channels? Yep. And they would carve channels like this throughout the canyons here? All over the area. Saad explains the channels were coated with a thin layer of stucco to keep the water clean and the channels protected from erosion. Sadly, most of these carved gutters have since crumbled from neglect. This is one of the Nabatian cisterns. Saad and I decide to get a closer look at one of the few cisterns still fed by rainwater today. Hello. Unfortunately, the eroding sandstone walls have fouled the water, making it undrinkable. You said I could possibly go down in there? Yes, you can. I have already... In order to calculate the amount of water this cistern would have held, I decide to climb inside the chamber and measure its depth. Saad's brought along some climbing gear so I can descend into the cistern. Since I don't have a tree or a pole to tie onto, I need to create an anchor point in the ground. First, we arrange the stakes in a pentagon shape to distribute stress on the anchor equally. After measuring the rope's length to the cistern, we hammer the stakes into the ground. Who needs trees? and I test the strength of my ground support. With harness and anchor in place, I'm now ready to head down into the cistern. Looks like some murky water. Here we go. Be careful, good luck. Thank you. As I descend into the mountain reservoir, I can instantly feel how precious rainwater would have been protected from the heat of the sun. The air is both cooler and more humid. I can feel the humidity already. Yeah, it's because this cistern is designed to prevent evaporation. Saad hands me a measuring stick to check the depth of the cistern. Today, most Nabataean built cisterns are shallow or empty because the water channels feeding the reservoirs have either fractured or eroded. The precious rainwater simply soaks into the sand. That's pretty deep. After checking the depth, our best guess is that the interior of this cistern may be about 15 feet high and about 12 feet wide. Uh, so normally we would expect it would have been up to here, right? Uh -huh. so I can see the water line going around there. Yeah. Over 2,000 years ago, this chamber would have been brimming with water after a heavy rainfall. And is this a typical size cistern? Is this big or small? This is medium size. Medium size, yeah. The total capacity of this system is about 50,000 liters. 50,000 liters, okay. That's nearly 13,000 gallons. Saad tells me the archaeologists have discovered nearly 200 cisterns in and around Petra. Estimates put their total capacity at around 11 million gallons of water, enough to sustain 100,000 people annually. Do you think that these holes up here were designed for like a bucket system? Yeah, actually they used to pull the water out through using uh, ropes and water skin. Saad explains that in ancient times, Petra's residents and traders would use ropes tied to sheepskin sacks to draw rainwater up from the cisterns. Large cisterns would have a wood pulley system fixed to the interior to more efficiently haul water up from the chamber. This ingenious system could satisfy the water needs of Nabataean citizens, but not the half million traders and their camel caravans that settled outside Petra's gates. To fulfill those needs, the Nabataeans relied on more than hydraulic innovation. Nature was on their side. Together, Saad and I travel about two miles from Petra to the neighboring village of Wadi Musa. The village's name literally means Valley of Moses. According to the Old Testament, Moses cracked his staff against a rock and water came out, creating 12 springs. Local legend holds that Moses created one of those springs right here in Wadi Musa. Saad and I descend into a stone shelter along the roadside. 
an arched chamber built by the Nabataeans during the time of Christ. So these are Nabataean arches? Yeah, Nabataean arches. And the columns are also Nabataean? The columns are Nabataean. As we work our way deeper into the subterranean chamber, I start to hear the sound of running water. Can I borrow that light for a sec? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So let's see, we gotta figure out where the water's coming from. I guess we can just follow the channel. And it's coming out here, happy time. For millennia, this natural spring has flowed into the valley of Wadi Musa. So this water is literally coming out of the mountain here. Yeah, from the rock. Yeah, from the rock. And according to local legend, it was this rock that Moses hit. Yeah, actually the local people believe that this is one of the 12 uh, Moses spring here in the region. Saad tells me the Nabataeans actually discovered and protected dozens of these springs and hundreds of cisterns throughout the Shara Mountains and surrounding valleys. These rich sources of water made Petra an oasis in the Arabian desert. It's okay to try it. Huh? Yeah. Good. Cool. Yeah, yeah it's the fresh water. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But this precious water wasn't a public resource. It was private property. Saad explains that the Nabataeans charged a heavy fee for outsiders to access their water. We leave the ancient chamber and follow the water, where it's channeled out of the mountain, under a modern city street, and into locally irrigated gardens. Mm -hmm. What crops are they growing here? Figs. Yeah. Limes. Got it. Olives. Recognize olives. And pomegranates here. So these are traditional Nabataean crops. The same crops was grown by the Nabataean. Coupled with the surrounding villages, Petra was one of the most watered lands in all of Arabia. This desert oasis was able to draw traders across hundreds of miles of desert to the city gates. As a result, the Nabataeans exerted incredible influence on this region. I'm exploring the most celebrated archaeological site in all of Jordan, the lost city of Petra. I've seen how its wealthy builders, the Nabataeans, were able to draw traders and their camel caravans to this desert city with water. By controlling this precious commodity, they were able to levy heavy fees on foreigners. But water wasn't the only source of wealth for the Nabataeans. Over 2,000 years ago, Arabian camel caravans transported some of the finest goods on earth. Traders were making sales that today would be valued in the millions. And the Nabataean kings demanded a piece of the action. I'm leaving Petra and heading 50 miles south to rejoin Prince Mirad Rad Al Hussein in Jordan's southern desert, Wadi Rum. The prince wants to show me the paths the ancient camel caravans took before Good entering you. Petra. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah, welcome to but to get there, we'll need to go off-road. Very cool. You weren't kidding when you said we're going to go someplace where my bike wouldn't go. We'll be riding in a Desert Iris 4x4, a converted Jordanian military vehicle built specifically to negotiate the thick desert sands. It's going to take us to Wadi Rum. Can I drive? Yeah, please go ahead. Be my guest. Oh. All right. In 1962, the movie classic Lawrence of Arabia was filmed here in the deserts of Wadi Rum. The golden sands are beautiful, but the terrain is barren, dry, and hot. Today, it's over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The well-watered Petra served as a welcome oasis for camel caravans traveling across ancient Arabia. Scholars believe the stone city was once the center of several trade routes, with caravans commuting from modern-day Saudi Arabia, Syria, Israel, and the Sinai Peninsula. It's like they're coming right at us. This is how it was in uh, ancient times. So this scene, right, hasn't changed much in thousands of years. Yeah, sure. This is, was the, you know, the trading route uh, to Petro. So I understand this is a modern caravan of camels. But yeah. if, if we were here back in the day when the Nabataeans and other traders were coming through, what would be in those bags? It was mostly frankincense and uh, myrrh. Uh, uh, incense. incense. Incense was really the, the big thing in those days. Uh, also, maybe spices. Incense was a key ritual ingredient in ancient times, used in most religious ceremonies. 
Westerners, like the Greeks and Romans, sought these spices brought in from Asia and the Sinai Peninsula. At Petra, the spice trade was brisk, and the Nabataeans capitalized on it. Along with the fees imposed on the traders for water, the Nabataean kings taxed every sale. Like this type of caravan is maybe 20 camels long, right? Is there any way to calculate how much money these traders were getting from these kinds of caravans? Yeah, well, the traders would make a profit of about three to four thousand dollars at today's prices per camel. Per camel? Yeah, at today's prices, yeah. Today's prices, which yeah. would mean sixty thousand dollars for this caravan. Yeah, most likely. The traders made a lot of money, and but of course they had to pay taxes and, uh, uh, and fees to the Nabataeans, you know. With the wealth they acquired from taxing the spice trade, the Nabataean kings commissioned the construction of Petra. I rejoined Dr. Khairiya Amar along the Street of Facades, a series of mountain chambers that dot the walls of Petra leading to the city center. Khairiya explains the Nabataean kings could afford to hire the world's best architects and artisans to create Petra. Some brought in from as far as Europe and North Africa. So the architecture here is a mixture of different cultures in the region. I think this is part of the genius of the Nabataean culture in that it got uh, elements from Mesopotamia, from Egypt, from Greece. It's this interaction with the other culture mm -hmm. which was a hallmark uh, of their culture mm -hmm. and brought it out in a style that's Nabataean, uniquely Nabataean. So as like the that, caravans are coming through, architectural ideas are being exchanged, and perhaps these craftsmen are also contributing to the way things look? Definitely. The Nabataean kings merged architectural influences and created Petra to be the capital of their kingdom. A kingdom that stretched from the Mediterranean Sea in the west to central Saudi Arabia in the east, covering an area of over 200,000 square miles. Archaeologists believe the exposed architecture at Petra, including the treasury, was constructed primarily between 100 BC and 100 AD. Amazingly, in a period of fewer than 200 years, the Nabataean builders created hundreds of sandstone structures and moved several million tons of rock and debris. To get a sense of the number of artisans and the labor involved carving Petra sandstone, I've enlisted the help of a local sculptor, Mohammed Nawefla. Good? Can go all the way around? Yes. I think a lot of people, when they first see Petra, their reaction, at least mine, was, no way. They didn't build this city, they carved it. And to get a feel for the stone here, Muhammad is actually showing me how to carve. This is an urn he made, this is an urn I'm working on, and we'll see how it goes. Just keep going around? Yes. Okay. Using basic carving tools, my goal is to see how long it'll take me to shape this urn. But I soon discover that carving this rock isn't as easy as it looks. Yeah, I want you to do it. Get a feel for it. Okay, okay. My turn, my turn, my turn. Okay. More and more. This local sandstone is softer than most rock, but it's still tough to chisel. It's gonna take a while. It's not that easy. I give it my best shot for over 30 minutes. God, you can feel that in your shoulder. The larger urn on the treasury would have been a lot more challenging. Slow and steady, slow and steady. Little by little, I shape the rock and with each stroke, my respect grows for the carvers who created Petra. I haven't finished yet, but I made good progress. And that's with modern tools. The Nabataeans would have used one of these. This was actually found here at Petra. But hitting the rock is pretty much the same. And this is for a small version of the urn, not the giant one that sits on top of some of these buildings. So my insight into Nabataean artistry, man, this is hard work. To create a city of this size, they would have needed hundreds, if not thousands of people doing what's very precise and hard labor. The Nabataean kings were so wealthy, they were able to hire hundreds of artisans to create their majestic masterpiece of stone, the Wall Street of ancient Arabia. Even today, evidence of Petra's ancient riches can still be found just beneath the desert sands. How do we know that the Nabataeans were wealthy? Well, first, there's the spectacular city of Petra itself. And we have these. 
Nabataean coins which turn up in the sand after every rainstorm. Even after 2,000 years, their streets are lined with their money. I'm exploring Petra, the red rose city built by the Nabataean kings over 2,000 years ago. Driving through Jordan's southern deserts, I've seen the ancient spice trade routes that camel caravans took to reach Petra. Trade that made the Nabataean rulers rich and powerful. And I've chiseled the same sandstone ancient sculptors once carved from Petra's rock walls. The stone city sprawls over 20 square miles of the Shara Mountains, posing a huge challenge for local archaeologists. Where do you start your search for Petra's lost treasures? According to most archaeologists, only a small portion of Petra has been excavated, which means the majority of the city still holds hidden treasures. Well, thanks to the assistance of Digging for the Truth and some modern technology, you and I are about to get our first look at some unexcavated terrain. I'm meeting Dr. Bilal Khrisat from the Hashemite University of Jordan. Bilal is operating ground-penetrating radar, a survey device created to peer beneath the surface. It maps subterranean anomalies electronically. At our request, Bilal has conferred with local archaeologists to determine a potential dig site, thought to be an ancient Petra marketplace. But before any excavation can begin, he must first survey the ground using GPR. Right. How does it work? We have uh, antenna which send uh, pulses of uh, electromagnetic waves in the ground. Mm -hmm. Some of these pulses are reflected and some are penetrated. They get lost, actually. This is the radar unit right here? Yeah, this is the antenna of the radar. So it's sending a pulse into the ground? Yes, and, and receiving... This creates the image? Yeah. Okay. This machine, which is in top, it collects from the antenna whatever is reflected, and it shows it in a different waves. Whenever we have change in the material below the ground, then we can mark that change as an evidence below the ground. And you just push it? Yeah, once you slowly. push it, it's very easy to use. You can try it, actually. It's okay? Yeah. Are we collecting data? Bilal allows me to operate the GPR and instructs me to watch for any peaks on the radar screen. They'll indicate a solid formation underground. Within seconds of pushing the device, I see something on the screen. Right there. Right? Mm -hmm. Right there was one. Bilal tells me the strength of the peak indicates something substantial underground. We mark the location both electronically and physically with a red flag. What do you think that could be? A tomb? No. Treasure? It couldn't be a small wall. Small wall's nice. Yeah. <laughs> Josh's wall. We're calling that Josh's yeah. wall. Not small wall, just yeah, Josh's Josh wall. wall. Yeah. Okay, let's find the other side of the wall. Okay. We continue moving forward and again find another formation underground. Not even two feet below the surface. Right there. Yeah. Oh, great. Red. Big peak. Oh, nice discovery. Big peak. It's like not even half a meter down. Sure. Can we dig? No, you Come can't. On. <laughs> it's like it's like this far <laughs> below the surface. <laughs> and it's a strong red line. And you know what? I, don't you want to dig? No, I don't right now. <laughs> Bilal reminds me that the GPR serves as a mapping device and was created to be a non-invasive tool. However, the readings we're collecting today will be made available to archaeologists conducting future excavations at the site. In 2003, this same high-tech tool was used to survey the plaza in front of the treasury. What the GPR found can only be described as the greatest archaeological discovery ever made at Petra. I've returned to the treasury to meet Dr. Suleiman Farajat, chief archaeologist of Petra National Park. Suleiman led the 2003 excavation of the Petra Plaza. Using ground-penetrating radar, he uncovered a hidden chamber at the base of the steps. He's offered to take me inside the treasury to a place few have ever seen. Yeah. Okay. We're going under. Okay. Oh, who first? Uh, you, please. Okay. Oh. I didn't even know okay. you do. I will follow you, please. Okay. Got it. <laughs> oh. Okay. This is very special okay. access. Down? Yeah. Down, please. Oh. Oh. Take care. Okay. We're going below yeah. the treasure. Okay. Follow me, please. This is so cool. Okay. Yeah. yeah I'll follow you. Okay. Using GPR, Suleiman discovered evidence of a subterranean staircase. The courtyard of the 
After excavating, he discovered a door at the base of the steps. The door opened into chambers directly beneath the treasury. Well, I didn't even know you could go under the treasury. Suleiman explains that when he entered the underground chambers, he immediately made a discovery that connected Petra back to the ancient spice trade that once fueled its wealth. Please. As we work our way through the cavernous rooms, Suleiman takes me to a collection of artifacts. Yeah. Oh, pottery. Pottery, yes. This Nabataean pottery dates to around the time of Christ. This bowl was reconstructed from sherds and has a residue of incense burned onto its smooth surface, a charred remnant of ancient frankincense. Can I hold it? Yes, please. Along with bowls are figurines of Aphrodite, a camel, and oil lamps that once illuminated what Suleiman believes was a ceremonial chamber. We enter an adjoining room. It was here the mystery surrounding the treasury's true purpose was finally solved. Did you find anything in here? Yes, we found actually, for example here, we found a skull and a skeleton for a person. People were buried here? Yes. Suleiman and his team excavated remains of not one, but 13 skeletons underneath the treasury. After analyzing the bones and pottery, he believes that the skeletons are the remains of a royal Nabataean family. Yes. Suleiman says it was King Aretas IV who ruled Petra between 9 BC and 40 AD who buried members of his immediate family here. These subterranean chambers serve as a royal crypt. What does all of this tell us then about the treasury? The treasury was a mausoleum. A mausoleum? A mausoleum, yes. Suleiman explains the treasury was created to serve as a ceremonial chamber for the Nabataeans, a ritual center to honor a king and his family. Now, having found additional evidence of burials and offerings throughout Petra, archaeologists can confirm these beautifully carved monuments were actually graves. The higher your position in Nabataean society, the grander the mausoleum you could have built in your honor. It's fascinating because today most people associate Petra, well, most people associate it with Hollywood, right? But for the people who come here and they see the beauty in the facades and the intricate carvings, we're not thinking that these are mausoleums for the dead, right? No, it's for the dead. But they are. Yeah. We're walking through a graveyard. It's a beautiful graveyard. But these are testaments to the kings of the past. Yes. And the royal families of the past. Yes. That's kind of spooky. The recent discovery of these tombs finally puts the mystery surrounding the treasury's true purpose to rest. The building was constructed to honor a Nabataean king, not to hide the gold of an Egyptian pharaoh. Nabataean kings, like Aritas IV, ruled Petra in great peace and splendor up through the first century AD. But soon, warring rivals, who longed to control the rich city, would advance to Petra's gates. I've come to Jordan in search of the lost treasures of Petra, a city first built by the Nabataeans over 2,000 years ago. I've carved the local sandstone to understand how the city of Petra was created, climbed inside cisterns to determine how the Nabataeans thrived in the Arabian desert, and even ventured beneath the treasury building to see how they buried their royal dead. What I've learned is that these desert traders were among the most affluent people ever to emerge in the Middle East. The Nabataeans thrived in the Shara Mountains for several centuries, growing wealthy from the spice trade they controlled here at Petra. Their kings and queens used their immense riches to have the best of everything, in life and in death. The Nabataean kings ruled Petra for nearly three centuries. They were able to maintain their seat of wealth and power up through the first century AD by bribing and allying with the rival Assyrians, Egyptians, and later, the Romans. Ultimately, their alliance with the Roman Empire would cost them control over the city. To find out why, I'm meeting Chris Tuttle, Assistant Director for the American Center of Oriental Research. Chris explains that the emperors of Rome had long coveted the Red Rose City. 
the Romans conquered the Nabataean kingdom during the first century. And the emperor Trajan made Petra Rome's Arabian capital in 106 AD. One structure that best illustrates the Roman dominance at Petra is the Great Temple, once the largest freestanding building on site. Chris takes me to a section of the temple to see a collection of Roman and Nabataean artifacts. The capitals we were just looking at. The space we're in is called a cryptoporticus. It's a large gallery beneath the colonnade. Most of this material comes from the main temple building itself. Bolus. Chris shows me a collection of decorative Roman cornices that once adorned the temple columns. You know what that is. It's a pine cone. Pine cone. He tells me these sculpted symbols reflected vegetation from both Rome and Petra. So we have acanthus, we have vines, we have pine cones. Pomegranates. Pomegranates and poppy seeds. All right. Stacked next to Chris, I notice a curious pile of stone balls. Uh, these are a type of weapon. Yes. They are they're called ballista balls. Did you throw them? Well, they would have been lobbed using a, a catapult-like piece of war machinery called a ballista. Ah, okay. And we think they were stockpiled in anticipation of a possible conflict. Chris explains that the ballista balls were actually found buried beneath the floors of the temple. They were created by the Nabataeans during the first century AD, the time of transition with the Romans. While these projectiles were clearly made for defense, they were never used. Chris says that the physical evidence of warfare at Petra is both scant and ambiguous. Most archaeologists believe the Nabataean rulers negotiated a peaceful settlement with the Roman Empire. This would protect their citizens and preserve their trade routes. What happens to the Nabataeans? Well, what we're really talking about is a changing government. The people who lived their lives here, ran their shops, and carried out their trade, did their farming, mm -hmm. they, they stayed the same as far as we can tell. We're, we're Chris believes the Nabataeans were allowed to continue their trade, but under Roman control. Archaeologists like Chris must rely on the physical record to mark the transition of power. So most of the changes that we can track is architecturally. Architecturally. Can we see more? Yes. Why don't we go take a look at some of it? Okay. Chris directs me to the rear section of the Great Temple to see another part of the Roman complex. This was an amphitheater that once sat up to 600 people. Do we know what this space was used for? Well, not specifically. There's a number of theories. This could have been ritual theater. It could have been special performances for just the elite. Mm -hmm. Or this could have been where the Council of Elders met. All through this period, Petra remained a seat of power. And the fact that it continued to be a seat of power is in evident in the continued expenditure of monies to make these massive modifications to these giant buildings. But even as the Romans are modifying this space, we still believe it was an important space. Absolutely. And perhaps the seat I mean, of power for both the Nabataeans and the Romans. Quite possibly. This is the largest freestanding building in Petra. Mm -hmm. And so it served a major purpose. In 330 AD, the Emperor Constantine moved the Roman capital to the eastern city of Byzantium, also known as Constantinople. The Christian Byzantines would go on to rule Petra for the next three centuries. To better connect Rome to China's Silk Road and India, the ancient trade routes to Petra were redirected north to Palmyra and Bostra, Roman strongholds since the first century AD. Chris believes this move marginalized Petra and marked the beginning of the end for the Nabataeans. And the Roman Petra's occupation had been pieced together largely through a sampling of Roman texts and limited archaeology. But in 1993, a major discovery was uncovered at this beautifully restored Byzantine church. We have very few written records from the Nabataean period and the Roman period. But from the Byzantine period, we're much more fortunate. We have a single cache of papyri that was found mm -hmm. in this church. Chris explains archaeologists recovered 150 papyrus scrolls preserved under a pile of rubble. Scholars speculate an earthquake destroyed the church in the early 7th century AD. Can I see them? Yes, it'll take a trip to Amman, though. I'll go to Amman. All right. Chris and I leave Petra and travel 120 miles north back to the Jordanian capital of Amman. He's brought me to the headquarters of the American Center of Oriental Research, ACOR. The papyri are kept here in deep storage. Chris explains that these artifacts from the Byzantine period 
provide a unique glimpse into the lives of the ancient Nabataeans. What you're looking at is exactly the way the papyri were found. Looks like charcoal. It does look like charcoal. The charcoal is the only reason we in fact have the papyrus. These were preserved because they caught fire during the earthquake that destroyed the church. And immediately while they were burning, the shelves that they were on and the wall behind the shelves mm -hmm. collapsed, sealing the burning papyrus under a pile of rubble so there was no oxygen. So they sat there and smoldered and as a result they carbonized and we, this is why we have them today. It's, it's ironic that the fire which should have destroyed them actually preserved them. Absolutely. Hmm. Chris lets me examine some of the carbonized fragments, preserved in ash for nearly 1,400 years. He explains these scrolls are so delicate that they must be kept in sealed containers and stored in darkness to keep them from falling apart. Some fragments represent the ends of documents and remain rolled tight, while other fragments with text have been flattened and affixed to rice paper. Since the ancient papyrus is carbonized, it's hard to decipher the writing. I can definitely make out scratch marks. I can't read that. What language is that? It's in Greek. In Greek? Byzantine Greek. Based on the scrolls, Chris explains Greek was the primary written language used in Petra during the Byzantine period. At the other end of the table, several of the papyrus fragments have been flattened and placed under sheets of glass. So, so once the fragments have been assembled, and then enhanced so that they're, they're readable, what do they say? These scrolls all belong to a single archive of a single family. All of this is from one family? All one family, seven generations represented. The main owner of the documents was a man by the name of Theodorus, and he was a deacon and later an archdeacon in the Petra church. So this is a wealthy family? It was a very well-off family of the time. All of the documents deal with legal issues for the most part. Issues of property division, taxation, deeds, wills, that sort of thing. So we're the charred archive also includes dowry arrangements and family disputes dating back to the early 6th century AD. What's clear from the text is that some of Petra's citizens living during the Byzantine period were still very established and very wealthy. Chris tells me this family held enough property and assets to be placed in America's upper class today. Sadly, the earthquake which led to the preservation of the papyri marked the beginning of the end for Petra. Most scholars believe the Nabataeans couldn't survive both the loss of their trade routes and a catastrophic natural disaster. Petra was largely abandoned by the end of the 7th century. Scholars believe the ancient Nabataeans simply took their fortunes and left. So from an archaeological point of view, this is the treasure. For us, right? yes, this is the treasure. Because this is giving us insights into a world that we wouldn't have known about without it. Absolutely. Could there be other treasures like this still at Petra? Given that less than 2% of the city has been excavated, statistically speaking, the likelihood is there. Built by the Nabataeans over 2,000 years ago, Petra still stands as a great symbol of lost opulence and power. Today, great stone facades and elaborate tombs commemorate the kings and queens who once ruled this region. These Arabian traders harnessed their natural resources and created an oasis for camel caravans looking to make their fortunes in the desert. With the help of modern science, we may one day rediscover hidden riches here at Petra. But for now, this beautiful stone city continues to guard its secret treasures.